don't know anything about my work, I, I always say that I'm, I'm sort of looking with half-closed eyes at the urban world, um, uh, looking at buildings with shapes and outlines, um, but also the matrix of rules and relationships in which those buildings are suspended. And you could almost call it a kind of medium design. Um, and in this, con in this contemporary experience economy, that matrix is usually made up of repeatable formulas or spatial products. You know what they are, skyscrapers, malls, golf courses, resorts, franchises, parking lots, airports, ports, free zones. And these almost, and this is a set of slides that I almost always show when I give a talk, and just to sort of uh, put in front of you what I mean by this kind of infrastructure space, because it's not an, an infrastructure like pipes and wires under the ground, um, but more like a, an all too visible enveloping medium uh, or a kind of spatial technology, uh, something like multiple spatial operating systems for the city. And this technological matrix is for me arresting not only because of its weird mixtures of violence and candy colored fairy tales, but also because it's a secret weapon of stealthy political power, because it's creating de facto forms of polity that are often outpacing law, and because it's rapidly 3D printing a new layer of, of the Earth's crust. But you know, beyond uh, communication media, um, this kind of medium thinking or medium design is, is really a habit of mine that's ever present in, in, and practiced in many disciplines. You know, you think about how oncologists now are analyzing not only the tumor, but, but chemical fluctuations in the surrounding tissue, or actors transmit information not only in their lines, but in a string of interdependent actions that are unfolding in time, where geologists don't, don't just taxonomize specimens, but but read them as traces of a process. So ever present, and, and, um, but I, I would still say maybe under rehearsed in culture in, in face of more dominant cultural habits. Because in some kind of fatal error, our beautiful, soft, watery human uh, organisms um, somehow accidentally assume a command and control habit of mind that, that loves being right. It's a culture that, that's good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at describing the relationships between things, the, the chemistries between things, or uh, the, the, the repertoires that things enact. It, it's a culture that privileges declarations, right answers, universals, telos, elementary particles. You know, it's captivated by circular logics, uh, modernist scripts that celebrate freedom and transcendent newness, narrative arcs that bend towards utopian or dystopian ultimates. So, so often it's a collective mind that, that looks for the one or looks for the one and only. Um, so, so often a mind that seems to be organized like a closed loop um, and since a loop that only, that only circulates compatible information can't, can't abide contradiction, it often then lashes out with a binary fight against, against any challenge. So this collective mind, um, uh, it, it, it favors successive rather than coexistent thoughts or practices. You know, the new right answer must kill the old right answer. We cry out with dramatic ideas of emancipation and freedom when that freedom is only a freedom that's, that's robbing someone else of, of their freedom. So smart is confused with new, empowered is confused with free. These are the sort of hackneyed plot lines of our humanities, you know, the binaries of war, the chess beating Westphalian sovereignty of nations. The, those remain the darlings of history. Homo economicus allowed to upstage and hold forth. 
We're always pulling out our old sci-fi futurologies out of mothballs. And, and the, the whole thing, you know, also has to, has to build to a, a revolution or an apocalyptic burnout. But I, but I want, with your permission, to say that we could think of those things as really laughably habitual thought. And, and when oscillating between loops and binaries, it's an unnecessarily violent culture that having eliminated the very information it needs is often banging away with the same blunt tools that are, that are really completely inadequate to address perennial problems or contemporary chemistries of power. So then a bully is elected, a migration of refugees swells in number, financial crisis makes properties worth less than nothing, an industrial disaster kills thousands, shorelines flood due to global warming. And if, if, the, if there are economic and military templates that provide no explanation, or if new technologies don't somehow provide the solution, if the consensus surrounding laws and standards and master plan provides no relief, it's as if the smartest people in the world are standing with hand to brow and dissent adopting the same binary also exists in a world of enemies and innocents. And, so, and since the world's big bullies and, and bulletproof forms of power thrive on this oscillation between loop and binary, it's as if there's nothing to counter them, um, nothing to counter things like the orange one. You know, on, on, only more, and we all, what have we got? You know, only more ways of fighting and being right and providing the very rancor that nourishes their violence. So how do you drop through a trap door and engage the flip side of these logics? Maybe the, the very, you know, socio-technical systems which I was talking to you about before, the repeatable formulas for formatting all the space around the world are even very good to think with because they're everywhere and nowhere. Um, from the micro to the macro scale, from institutions to cities, they're too large or, or too widely distributed to be assessed as a discrete object with a name or shape or outline. They don't respond to singular solutions and determinations and they, they can only really be assessed by the activity or disposition imminent in their organization as it unfolds over time and territory. But in any context, large or small, designing the medium is managing the potentials and relationships between objects, the, the activity or disposition that's imminent in their organization. So the disposition of, of any organization makes some things possible and some things impossible, or, or like a growth medium, it determines what will survive, or, or like an operating system, it sets the rules of the game that link and activate components of relationship. And maybe our, our histories and new dramatic futures or lubricated freedoms and emancipation on this flip side don't make sense. And, and however unlikely it may seem in, in medium design, you would discover extra political and aesthetic capacities, even redoubled territory of operation in unlikely places, in, in interplay, in indeterminacy, in failure, in heavy information, in discrepancy, and, and latent temperament in organizations. Since, since unreasonable politics easily unravels reasonable politics, and we have great examples of that, luckily, be in, in medium design, being right is a really bad idea. It's way too weak. It doesn't work against gurus and totalitarian bullies. And maybe it cultures spectacular failures together with some underexploited powers of, of medium inspire alternative ways to register the design imagination, form making in another key or part of speech. We as designers are very good at making things, you know, with, with shapes and outlines, but medium design is less like making a thing and more like having your hands on the faders and toggles and dials of organization. It's the design of interdependencies, chain reactions, ratchets. Maybe it benefits from an artistic curiosity about reagents in mixtures, 
um, designing not a single object, but a platform for inflecting populations of objects. There would be an artistic comfort with dynamic markers and unfinished processes. The dispositions of space then manipulated not with right answers and solutions and master plans, but with something more like time-released, active forms, multipliers, switches, or some other organ of interplay that has a, an extended temporal dimension um, that allows the design to unfold and remain in play. So medium design would then be something like playing pool, where knowing one fixed sequence is of shots doesn't do you any good, but, but being able to see branching networks of possibilities allows you to add more information to the table. In pool, you know, you don't, you don't know, you don't know that, like you know the right answer. You know how, um, like knowing what to do next, um, to respond to a string of changing conditions. Um, it's, so it's not, it's not indeterminate to be equivocal or vague or uh, somehow unknowable, but it sounds contradictory. It's, it's indeterminate to be practical. So how do you practically design an organ of interplay? For instance, usually in design, you know, in, in the, tip, the design we're used to, you can only kind of add an object, you know, add built material. Um, but if you consider an interplay of spatial variables that's adjusting an ecology of building, ebbs and flows, you could even think about the subtraction of architecture in floodplains or in distended suburbs. And, and I, won't, I won't go into detail about this, about this protocol, but, but it imagines reverse engineering the mortgage that's been the multiplier of sprawl and even global financial and environmental disaster um, and it asks, you know, what if you introduce interplay by simply considering mortgages in groups that are rated for complementary or counterbalancing attributes that reduce collective risk? And, and anything can be gamed. Any kind of interplay could be either dangerous or productive, but an interplay might have enough temporal dimension to react to changing conditions or to respond to the moment when it's outmaneuvered. It's not a solution then, it's something that shouldn't always work. And so designing something like this protocol that is indeterminate to be practical is something like medium design and replacing the kind of parboiled master plans, what are the pop culture cinematic time-lapse documents that show these ratcheting changes. Those flooded properties I was just showing you only become available in failure. Uh, it's like cities in like Detroit or New Orleans where the, the city fathers throw up their hands and say, you know, it's here, the financials just don't work. Um, that's the moment where medium design can kind of, where you can kind of roll up your sleeves. Um, think about those, those properties I was just showing you that when financially underwater in, in, such, in such spectacular failure cease to be traffic mortgage products and return to being land and buildings in weather and gravity. Um, and so while in a world of closed loops, organizations and institutions try to eliminate error, Medium design actually works better when you multiply problems and when you use them to leaven and catalyze each other. It's a little bit like that very um, counterintuitive game theory called Pirando's Paradox um, it, that, that pairs losing games to generate wins um, and the losses uh, create a kind of ratcheting traction to create small gains. So in medium design, it's, it's, not even, it's not even really the, the content of a problem, but it's just the interplay between problems that's, that's important. Um, beyond the newness and succession of technologies is then the relationship between technologies. So that field of failed and emergent 
uh, technologies in interplay makes an ever-present wilderness that redoubles the territory and material for design ecology. So even, even again, even without digital devices, the heavy spatial information system is dancing with, with potentials that are essential to innovation and governance. So smart then, you know, when we all say smart city and so on, smart may mean not one supposedly transcendent species of information, but smart means mixtures of different kinds of information, like the digital together with the heavy or the spatial. Here's another protocol of interplay with completely different content. It, you know in the jungles of Kenya, where this is the forest of the Amazon, you know that there's already a strong relationship between roads and erasure of the forest. Like we usually think of roads as, as, as uh, conduits of progress and opportunity or the means to deliver um, infrastructure like broadband in rural or wilderness areas. But we also know that they can erase information in those cities that's imminent in, in the landscape, in the cities, in the villages. If you're thinking of those landscapes and cities and villages as themselves an information system. You've, seen, you've all seen images like this. So this protocol considers an interplay between broadband, roads, and forest or jungle. Uh, it argues that it might be more productive to dial down roads, the gray lines, when dialing up broadband, the red radiating circle, to preserve farms and forests, which is the green information system that attracts more resources for, for tourism or for education. So here, digital and spatial platforms can make each other more information rich or more information poor. And you see a road, uh, as well as a bit of code, hacking a telecommunications network. Medium design, also like pool, is a game that's surrounded by hustlers and it has a currency and discrepancy. So to assess and manipulate medium is almost as if you have to cultivate a capacity to see in a split screen, to sort of straddle mental partitions between um, the nominative uh, and, and the active or dispositional. It, I often think it's something like developing a canine mind where you hear, you know, you, you hear your human saying the words, you know, good girl, and you've learned what those words, good girl, mean, but you'd ne a dog would never rely on a kind of one-to-one -one assigned meaning. Instead, they're looking at you for a thousand other affective cues, how close you are to the door or the dog bowl, or whether you have your, a leash in your hand, uh, or even your, your temperament. So in this split screen, you're sort of turning the sound down on those declarations. It's easier to detect the difference between what an organization is saying and what it's doing. Um, how, how organizations decouple their messages from their real activity and underlying disposition. So, so if you're better at, at detecting disposition in medium, then it's easier to sort of see in a split screen the difference between the stories and the, and the disposition. On one side of the screen, there are stories about the, the kinds of socio-technical networks that I study, whether they're railroads or hydroelectric networks or blockchains, and, they're all, and the, script is, the script that accompanies them is almost always about decentralization and freedom. Just like this, this is you know, the Ethereum uh, logo, right? But the, but the real disposition of the organization may actually be concentrating power and authority or have a kind of you know, universal ambition. Or the smart city uh, you know, maintains the shine of the new, um, even when it centralizes information in its disposition, even when it violates privacy, even when the network is primitive and crude in disposition. A dumb binary of likes and dislikes filters a social media network that purports to be information rich. 
a global network of Dubai-style zone cities facilitates not free trade, which is its story, but manipulated trade. Or a centralizing power espouses a populist message. Or the world's superbugs and bulletproof forms of power, you know, they, they may be masters of, of demagoguery and binary head-on brutality. You know, they will, until the end, punch and counterpunch, but they're also masters of that split screen. Like the confidence man, you know, they, they know how lies work. Um, and just like being right is a really bad idea in medium design, telling one lie is a really bad idea. Telling one, telling, 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 uh, telling many lies, though, w works, works very well. You know, one lie calls for for reconciliation and truth, but many lies creates a kind of Teflon on which rationality begins to slip and slide. And the superbug knows how lies, how lies can be made to dance around and fascinate in the absence of, of meaning and information. Lies are everywhere and they animate and um, insulate, uh, they lubricate, um, and the, and the discrepancy that all the sort of righteous people are, are, are futilely trying to reconcile is the perfect material for fully mediated rumor and contagious fictions that are battering the walls, working the back channels. So it, and again, it's not what lies say, it's sort of how they bounce. Um, the superbug then can become pure medium activity divorced from, from content, from meaning. If you're considering putting a few of these ideas together, considering interplay, interdependence, failure, heavy information, and discrepancy altogether, he, here's a super saturated story, you know, about automated vehicles. Um, automated vehicles are, are, are supposed to be now the means to perfect driving reduce emissions, increase productivity. But as I think as you all know, in this kind of pure embrace of a new technology, there is a boomerang effect. If, if um, uh, automated vehicles are, uh, uh, you know, provide the same hands-free ride as does transit, and if they're used in lieu of transit, imagine every seat in a transit car the size of a car, they will create a form of congestion that's unprecedented. So that you will have a very smart vehicle and just a very dumb traffic jam. <laughs> and in our usual habits of mind then, to remedy that, that boomerang effect, the only thing we could do is, the, is have another new technology. It would be we, we need a solution in the next emergent technology like futuristic flying cars or something like that. But an alternative response that would be more in the habit of mind of medium design is to alter a relationship between technologies or to rewire the network even with a spatial variable in a spatial information system, in a, in a heavy information system, a physical architectural volume that acts like a switch when placed between existing transportation uh, networks. So the switch um, just an intermodal node for upshifting and downshifting into transportation of different capacities up into transit or down into walking and cycling or something like that. It, it turns out may offer the best model for organizing um, the maintenance, the innovation, the investment, e even the liability um, for this shifting transportation ecology. So designing that switch would be something like medium design. And, you know, would come with architectural solids that we're used to making, it would come with volumes. But then if you really wanted to do it, if you, if you really wanted to reduce emissions and sprawl while increasing the ridership of transit and increasing the ridership of AVs, um, you'd also have to have the stomach for the spin that went with it. Here I'm showing you this kind of silly, soft focus image of, of Grand Central. But, but you'd also have to, you'd have to be working both sides of the screen. 
with a sort of sneaky story telling the soft focus ads that portray the seduction of switching. And, and that story, you'd have to have a story that would pry the car from, from the cold, dead hands of, of Americans. So, so while we might be bored with the safety of the purely rhetorical, the design that has any hope of affecting change has to manipulate the organization, the space, the arrangement, as well as the narrative um, that attends it uh, with moves that are sneakier or more politically agile. And it may be, it may be a dissonant story um, that however non-physical has physical consequences. Or it may be a narrative that makes something contagious um, or that generates a Teflon surface of its own. Or it may have an emotional message that, that renders some power more vulnerable. Or it may just have a surprising cultural bounce because of its irrationality or its outrageousness or its cuteness or its creepiness or its violence. To observe these organizations in this kind of canine split screen, not only the stories and lies on one side, um, but also the, 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 the actual disposition of the organization on another, is, is to observe temperament in organization. And it's not something we usually think about, um, but a potential for concentrating or distributing power as well as potential for escalating or reducing violence. And the free zones that I study really graphically model culture's violent tendency to form loops that only circulate compatible information and expel any incompatible or convenient, inconvenient circumstance, any challenger or other like the worker workers always on the receiving end of violence in these environments that are, that are also ironically saturated with uh, management ease about best practice acronyms and bullet pointed lists and mandalas and motivational aphorisms that often only inoculate power against change. Again, the loop keeps, keeps closing. The house, the house is always winning and then squaring off in a binary against the worker. Uh, and punctuating events like crises, uh, competitions, victories, defeats, those are the things that usually capture the, the most familiar cultural narratives, the imagination and attention of the most familiar cultural narratives. But in medium design, disposition doesn't happen um, because it's, an ever it's ever present as a latent quality. Just like glass doesn't have to break to be brittle, dispositional qualities are changing and unfolding. So this is the Rana Plaza collapse. Um, and if an unsafe factory collapses or burns, there, there is an event um, to mark the violence. And we know what to do with that. Um, but in countless factories or industrial parks that don't happen to buckle under the weight of their own denial and, and, and violence. It's not the violence of the, of the explosion or the gunshot or the drawn sword. Instead, there's only constant aggressions, uh, blatant, imbalanced power dynamics. And medium design might be a way of, of, of detecting and manipulating that latent uh, temperament. And in the histories, you, you would be then telling not only the story of things that shouldn't always work, but history of things that don't happen. Um, and it might be structured like an epidemiology or, or branching set of thresholds um, and points of leverage. Um, it might be concerned with how to modulate violence in organizations by making them more information rich. So in this, in this funny history, we would be looking for gradients of, uh, of, of political metastasis and remission, um, like, like the amazing shift in temperament in, in Stanley Kubrick's uh, 1960 movie Spartacus. I don't know if you've seen it uh, or if you're too young, um, but, you, but it, here's the story. In Spartacus, uh, a Roman authority gathers a whole bunch of slaves shackled together in, in front of them and, 
um, says that only, only Spartacus, the insurgent Spartacus, will be crucified and the rest of them will be spared if, if Spartacus will reveal himself. And Kirk Douglas, who's Spartacus, is about to stand up and say, I am Spartacus. And then Tony Curtis, a fellow slave, stands up and says at the exact same time, I am Spartacus. And then all the slaves stand up all at once saying, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. And suddenly in that, in that weird little gradient, um, everything shifts, um, and the Roman authorities are are forced to they are are just sort of disarmed and forced to um, uh, uh, extinguish all of their slaves. And similarly, there there's countless ways to adjust the solids and liquids of the urban world to reduce violence and tension. It's a little bit like um, the mater material advantage in a chess game. Um, beyond market value, urban morphologies and typologies and relationships embody potentials. Um, they concentrate or distribute power. They have the power. They have a latent temperament, a power to include or exclude. And the urbanity we're, we often favor relies on breaking loops and binaries by multiplying and, and diversifying components by placing them in interdependent relationships. <coughs> so uh, the typical idea of disposition is the disposition is like a ball on an inclined plane. You know, the, it can be latent. The ball doesn't have to roll down the hill. Um, so in medium design, can you adjust stories and organizational potentials on both sides of the screen in, in ways that are attuned to latent temperament. Um, so in addition to the, the master plans and declarations that we make, would we be something more like a parent who has to come in and break up two squabbling children? And when you are a parent with squabbling children, you never litigate the argument, the, the content of the argument that the, that the two are having. Instead, you alter disposition you, you increase the blood sugar of one child, you um, open the window, you uh, introduce a pet into the arms of the other child. You're, you're changing the potentials for violence in the chemistry of the room. So consider another latent temperament, a project that I was showing you as you were walking in. Um, all the global infrastructure, infrastructure space that I study is perfectly streamlined the global movement of billions of products, tens of millions of tourists and cheap laborers. But at a time when 65 million people in the world are displaced, more than at any other time in the history of the planet, somehow there's no way to move X million people away from atrocities like those in Syria. Um, the, you know, the nation state um, only has a dumb on-off button for granting citizenship or asylum Again, it's the clo it's a closed loop um, that lashes out with a binary this time against the immigrant, and the extra state layers of governance, like the NGocracy, offer as their their best idea uh, storage uh, in a refugee camp, a form of detention lasting on average 17 years. Actually, if the free zones that I've been showing you are kind of the chief nodes for privileged movements of goods and people outside the constraints of national law, the refugee camp is almost its kind of perverse carceral cousin. And the migrations of recent years have been especially uh, violent and polarizing, um, where migration is portrayed uh, not as the constant that it has been through history, but as a kind of crisis that needs the solution. And those migrating are portrayed as victims uh, or the other, again, in this kind of binary opposition with right-wing xenophobic sentiments. Um, so if you wanted to alter the temperament um, and dispositional potential of this organization, um, could you move away maybe from the sharp end of the conflict and work on some remote set of switches and larger networks? Uh, could you counter the violence of the loop and binary and work on the medium to multiply, so 
not one and binary, but a way to multiply one-to-one -one exchanges uh, that have historically supported some of the most successful travel. So if you could do this dispositionally and temperamentally, you might be moving away from the one, the loop, and the binary to the one-to-one -one and the many. And many is the name of, a, of an online platform that I've been working on that's designed to facilitate migration through an exchange of needs. So it first refuses to regard migrating people as victims. Um, and it serves those who want to resettle, but also the, those who want to keep traveling, um, who never wanted the citizenship that the nation withholds or reluctantly bestows. So it's a platform that speaks for those who might say, I, I don't really want your citizenship or your victimhood or your structured racism or your bad jobs. I, I don't want to stay. So also dispositionally, it's trying to kind of uh, rob the right wing of its best argument and, and leave, leave the right wing to kind of throw itself against an open door. So the, the, it's speaking for those who might say, I, we, 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 we don't want your citizenship. Instead, we want a kind of cosmopolitan mobility that's based on a more robust networking of short-term project-based visas that can be aggregated um, for global credentials. So this many platform, and it's, uh, I, I present it to you for critique, um, but it's asking if there could be a kind of a global form of matchmaking between the sideline talents uh, and needs of migrating population and a multitude of needs uh, all around the world. So there, there are no haves and have-nots. Um, uh, only needs, as with, as with Perando's paradox, only needs and problems that, that can be put together, that are the necessary assets of this, of, this chemistry, of this chemistry. And cities can then bargain with their underexploited, often failed uh, spaces to attract a changing influx of talent and resources, matching their needs with the needs um, of mobile people to generate mutual benefits space and time, uh, failures, problems, and opportunities for training in non-market exchanges. And, and might this cosmopolitan mobility organize around intervals of time or seasons of life uh, to form uh, a more agile uh, um, or, or practical uh, approach? And, and might uh, the spatial variables that we know about have more authority in global governance. And this is the, the platform that we were just sort of trying to rehearse at the Venice Biennale in which we're continuing to develop. Um, but it in no way pretends that the visa game is not a fraught and dangerous um, uh, place to be. It's not a sunny one world sharing app. Um, and this medium design is is arguing for mixtures of information and systems that, that don't privilege new technology. So you might be asking, well, then why is she making an app? Um, but this is, in a way, um, uh, the app is not the object of design. It's just an aggregator or prompt for, for re-aggregating spatial variables in a heavy information system in, in cities. Um, it's kind of low tech, like a bulletin board or a slot machine. Um, and it's also developing a kind of graphic conceit where the more heterogeneous or lumpy um, the information, the more trustworthy it is. Uh, you know, a nod to Fluxus member Jurgis Makunas' spell your name with these objects, or Paul Elliman's uh, typographies, or hobo code, or uh, cuneiform. So I'm. Now asking, you know, can this platform avoid the very dangers that it critiques? Um, and can these strings, more like strings of journeys, be anticipated, celebrated, accredited as, as again, not the mark of a victim, but the mark of the highly prized, linguistically talented uh, diplomats and, and, and leaders of the world? Um, and again, you know, can it move from 
the one and the binary to the one-to-one -one and the many? And, and might some of the world's other uh, seemingly intractable and unresponsive problems, superbugs, bulletproof forms of power, losing games, could they respond to medium design? Um, and with an, with an ability to detect and manipulate interplay and indeterminacy and failure and heavy information and discrepancy and latent temperament, what, what, might, uh, what potentials are there for a stealthier form of activism? playing both sides of the screen with messy, impure, non-modern mixtures of, of spatial change and the gifts and pandas and rumors and, and meaningless distractions and other totemic fictions that are so effective in culture. So here, finally, on this flip side, right answers are mistakes. Obligations are more empowering than freedom. Histories follow latent aggressions as well as gunshots. Messy is smarter than new. You deliberately address problems with, with responses that shouldn't always work. And maybe you can steal some of the, the powers of infrastructure space to design a snaking chain of moves that worms into and, and generates leverage against intractable politics. And like a really good pool player, you, you don't necessarily call your shots, but keep them guessing. So it would be like being too smart to be right. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too long because of all the changes. That um, we open this for questions at this point. Thank you very much. Um, Keller, thank you for this talk, um, and sorry for the technical difficulties, but everything's social before it's technical, so socially we're fine. Um, and uh, um, I, I'm wondering about the use of the word medium in this, you know, um, especially given that, that, you know, it's one of those words that with, you know, Sarah Whiting and, and Michael Meredith, you know, I mean, there, it's one that, that, that's been used in architecture before to very different effects and ideas. And, um, and, and it, at, at appearance, doesn't seem to match the uh, ambitions of uh, of you know this kind of super heterogeneous you know genius messy kind of you know um, seizing um, it it speaks more to yeah like you you understand it speaks more to a kind of mid midline a balance uh, you know not so much this not so much that can you speak more about what you mean by medium well I. I I mean, one of the reasons why I chose to use that word um, is because I have colleagues who are, are media theorists. And as I was saying, um, they, are, they are returning or want to return to elemental uses of the word medium, to uh, ref you know, the way the word medium originally was used, to mean middle or milieu or uh, surrounding environments of, earth, of air, earth, wind, fire. Um, and media theorists are wanting to do that, um, not only to deal with like, sort of larger environmental issues and, and digital ubiquity, but they're feeling that they're not, that they don't have um, a, you know, they're sort of in crisis wondering, you know, how, how do we have, we're not trained to, you know, somehow work with these things. That, the history of media theory is still often bracketed by communication technologies. Um, so in a way, th this, um, this, this, some of this work is meant to kind of offer to not only media theorists, but many that I, I mentioned uh, from oncologists to, to people in many other disciplines who are looking to matrix instead of object. Um, and I'm saying that we actually have a really good, really explicit way 
We, we're skilled, at, we're good at this, we could do this. Um, we, and we can even offer it to others to use the matrix space um, that maybe we have sometimes ignored, but um, that I've certainly paid a lot of attention to, the, the, the kind of um, infrastructure space that's rapidly changing the globalizing world, that this puts us in kind of a really interesting position to offer uh, to many different disciplines um, evidence that makes us more and more aware of the dangers and un unexpected political capacities of that space, but that it also models another habit of mind as well for spatial and non-spatial problems. Um, but you make me aware that, I mean, you make me aware that I, I, I hadn't really anticipated uh, Whiting and Meredith as things that I should think about. Uh, I, I sailed over that. Uh, so I, sh I should go back. Go no, think about I that. If that might be a good thing um, yeah. <laughs> to, to, to sail past that. But it, it is, you know, I mean, it, it, it is a, 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 an interesting provocation on their side because theirs is a kind of like in the face of heterogeneity, I got nothing. Right, whereas yours seems to be like in the face of heterogeneity, we have everything, right? You know, and and I think then I would emphasize the design portion of that, right? And that the you know that the design is the kind of thing that we do best. That it, if I understand that correctly, yeah. Yes, yes, and I, I mean, I there's a couple of different talks that I use to talk about medium design, and for some reason tonight I did the one that was a little bit more. Um, I don't know, ad advanced into the ideas rather than kind of taking baby steps into it because I figured this was the audience for that. But um, it, uh, th this is absolutely practical thinking about design. Um, uh, a, a, a mode of practice that we are working on um, uh, to deal with urgent problems, physical problems. Thank you very much. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about your thoughts about the actors in medium design? As you were talking, I was, I was kind of getting a picture of, the, of an individual, you know, the pool player, the stealthy activist that's moving laterally between all these systems and stuff, but that's not realistic. And particularly if you're saying this is a very practical thing, what is a medium design team in your conception? Yeah, I think it's a team. It's a team, uh, and I don't know about about you all, but I I notice in my own students that often what they're wanting when they're coming to school is a chance to find a way, is a chance to make that network of of partners um, in different disciplines and um, uh, who you know with whom with whom they can work on 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 the wicked problems um, uh, because they, they really don't want to be just confined in our architecture society hierarchies. That's an unsustainable proposition anyway. So it's a more, it's uh, they're taking a more entrepreneurial position and by, by entrepreneur, I don't, I mean, I don't mean, you know, a commercial entrepreneur, in fact, the kind of startup culture Stanford D School kind of culture stuff that that we see universities taking up doesn't work for this. You know, I think it, it, innovation is an, the the interplays that one would be inventing. They are inventions, but the advent of that kind of invention or innovation, I think, looks a lot different from startup culture uh, launching. You know, um, so it, it's asking a lot of our students to, you know, be able to deploy their skills in such a, such a novel way, um, under rehearsed, well not novel, but under rehearsed way. Um, but. Thank you very much for being very inspiring. Um, my question is, um, how do you stop this momentum of your, the contagion that you are, uh, you know, that you say is the binary aspect. 
um, because sometimes that contagion can also breed another kind of binary response. And you're asking all of us to be thoughtful and skilled and the skills that we, and I'm now thinking about the real world, similar to Mallory's question, the skill that I also see is that you have to be a very skilled person in the government setting because we watch all these, um, you can watch the local news and see what's being approved and not approved. And they're, if they're all, the members that are on the board are all falling into you know, this, uh, it's not even, a, there's no network, right? If they're operating on discrete information that's not even interconnected. And these are governmental people that make big policies. And so my question to you is um, like what we call the transportation center at Salesforce. It has now become the grand central of the West. So it repeated itself on the West Coast. Not a lot of thoughtful connectors to other buildings or what happens to the fabric of downtown. So that's like a good example. How do we get around all of that? You know, you need an intelligent team, you need financiers, you need good people in government that are outspoken. You need the thoughts and skills of the students in this audience, practitioners. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I'm trying to figure out how do we share this with our students so that we become the activists we want to. Yeah. Well, I don't have, I don't have, uh, you know, uh, sort of obviously don't have answers, but, um, uh, but, I, but I also, um, when working with my design students, um, and I, at Yale I teach a, a whole range of students. I, I teach all those students, you know, who are going to be the little McKinsey consultants, you know. I teach outside of the architecture school. So all the students that are going to work for Deloitte, who are, who are going to be, you know, like the global decision makers, they're not as smart as my design students. They're not as good at correlative thinking. Um, and so I often am, I'm, so I'm not saying to my design students, oh, you should go and get an extra policy degree or you should do this in government or something like that. It's not that one it wouldn't be aware of that or wouldn't want to partner in, in, in robust ways, but, but I am arrogantly uh, arguing that, that you know, that those students who were getting the Deloitte and McKinsey degrees who were going to be the CIA agents, they, they need to know about what we do, um, that, that I'm trying to make spatial practices have another authority in global, global governance, but also just in, in global decision making. Um, so not always waiting for government, but working around in um, social, political, even commercially entrepreneurial ways. Um. Hi, uh, thank you for the really great lecture. This kind of paradigm shifting. Um, in the, uh, on the lecture, I was quite um, speculating the relationship that you're bringing uh, between high performance objects and the uh, medium thinking because it seems like um, the high performance objects are kind of byproducts of binary thinking and closed the loop. However, uh, when we commonly think about this types of medium thinking that um, you're telling us here, we normally assume the byproducts of the binary thoughts and the super um, high performance objects to be there in the background to help us to get the medium thinking and the results to come out. For example, um, for the Manny uh, project and the app, we would have to assume that there will be, uh, you know, fast uh, reception and, you know, signal towers, bandwidth and all of these mm -hmm. things in the background mm -hmm. to even run our medium thinking. So I was wondering kind of this uh, relationship, it's not against each other, uh, how you think about it, yeah. Right, uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right when you're talking about these sort of high performance uh, technologies. Um, so f so for me, so there, there's the high performance technologies and we can keep thinking, oh well, we, we will progress by making higher and higher performance technologies. And that, that's 
you know, that, that's true in some ways. But what I'm, what I'm arguing is something um, that tries to think of those together with the things we've already made. Um, it, and it comes from someone that I studied a long time ago, who, Benton Mackay, who talked about there being a kind of um, constant wilderness in, in the relationships between uh, the newest technologies and, and the incumbent technologies. Um, that the interplay between those is, is a kind of redoubled territory to work with. So you, you're, not, so you're not just relying on existing or incumbent technologies, but nor are you relying just on there being kind of the next new technology to solve the problem. So it's a kind of um, interplay between what we've already made and, and the newest things that, that we've made. So it's like, you know, so if you see what I mean, it, um, in Mackay, uh, it came up with this idea because the planet, the North and South Pole had just been discovered. And he, he was saying, okay, so the whole, so the whole uh, planet's now been kind of mapped in some way. Um, how do we find, how do we kind of roll back in the other direction to find a wilderness in the stuff we've already made? And it's with, it's that that is the inspiration for thinking about what, is, is it more, what is more information rich? Is it more information rich to have the newest, newest data technologies and digital technologies? Or is it more information rich to mix those with spatial information systems, uh, heavy information systems? That's sort of what I'm trying to play around with. Keller, um, very thought-provoking. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you to expand on um, something I'm noticing. Um, so the heterogeneity um, that you've talked about, um, so, I, so by, by logical extension, it would mean that the medium design has to coexist at the same time with the kinds of approaches that it is critiquing um, simultaneously. So in other words, we all, you know, whichever program we subscribe to, we have to learn to sit with not just the ones that we vote for or that we want to pursue and, you know, so we can't proselytize. Um, so, could, so the interplay between medium design and the rest, could you expand on your thinking on what that interplay would be like? Um, well, I I'm, I'm guess I'm... I guess I s I'm sort of thinking there might be um, an open circuit, a, a, an actual, a, an easy way to uh, take up things that other people think have failed, you know, like um, the other, that, that are remaindered, you know, that have been discarded, you know, that there's, that if you can work with the potentials of those things, um, nobody's really going to bother you, you know, while you're doing that. So, kind of, it, it, I mean, I suppose it's, um, you know, politically, we're politically and uh, technically working against expectations, um, uh, or at least that's what I'm, I'm hoping there might be kind of an open path to to doing um, that kind of work. But it's not, it's not, it's not, exclu it's not excluding. The new, the new. It's just not relying entirely on the new, and it's um, t so it's not creating kind of yet another binary against the new. It's just embracing a larger field. Um, I don't know if that is addressing your question. Um, designers to look at, to look for these um, overlooked, underused, or discarded opportunities um, and quietly on their own without fanfare make changes? 
Well, or maybe fanfare is necessary. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's, as, as I was saying, this is not, this is not for, uh, you know, the, the, if you want to do it, you also have to have the stomach for the, for the story that makes it contagious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not. I don't think it's a, a story of the long suffering architect. Mm -hmm. I think it's the story of you know, like a sneaky, architect. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture. I appreciate you coming. Um, it was very thought provoking. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming to the lecture and I hope to see you in future lectures uh, during this semester. Thank you.